Hi everybody, Brendan here with another edition of This Month in Punk Rock History. You may recall last month when we talked about the St. Patrick's Day Elks Lodge riot in Los Angeles that saw a number of injuries at the hands of overzealous police. This month, we take a look at the heavy-handed tactics of the British police. It's April 2023, and this month in punk rock history, I'll tell you about the conflict's gathering of the 5,000. But first, as always, I want to take a moment to offer a quick shout-out to my host, Sweet Jimmy Network. Check out previous editions of This Month in Punk Rock History, as well as 60 Second Reviews and Scatterbrain Movie Reviews. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe and start fights in the comments section. Now, let's get into it. When Crass called it quits in 1984, conflict took up the mantle as the loudest voice in UK anarcho-punk. Formed in 1981, their first EP was a Crass Records release. Their first LP was on a sister label, Corpus Christi. They followed the LP with To a Nation of Animal Lovers, an EP whose title track featured guest vocalist Steve Ignorant, still of Crass at the time. On April 18, 1987, Ignorant joined Conflict on stage at the Brixton Academy for the now infamous Gathering of the 5000. Built as a multi-purpose benefit, the event featured booths in support of Animal Liberation Front, Anti-Apartheid Movement, London Greenpeace, Hunt Saboteurs Association, Class War, Houseman's Bookshop, Compassion in World Farming, Anti-Fascist Action, and several others. It was a bit of a grandiose idea arising from the frustration with the underground punk scene dying a slow death in the shadow of commercialization. Conflict frontman Colin Jerwood and former crash singer Steve Ignorant were sitting around one, quote, cold, wet afternoon in January 87, pontificating on the sorry state of the decade-old scene. As activists, they couldn't just sit back and let the most powerful force in music die a quiet death, so they decided to join forces and put on a punk show. But not just any other typical punk show. It had to be different, says Jerwood, a mouthy, well-over-the-top gig in the biggest venue we could find this side of Wembley. The question was how to pull this off. You may recall the Sex Pistols' first big tour featuring more cancellations than bookings in 76. Well, Conflict faced a similar shadow ban. So when they got through to Simon Parks, manager of the Brixton Academy, Jerwood went undercover to book the gig. In his book, Parks writes, I was approached by a guy called Colin from Rough Trade. It seems the promoter didn't recognize Conflict, but Rough Trade was basically a household name in the music scene. After several meetings between Jerwood and Parks, a deal was signed on stolen Rough Trade letterhead, and a date was set, Saturday, April 18th, 1987, the day before Easter. The gathering of the 5,000 would coincide with the anniversary of the resurrection. Conflict took this as a good omen. As I said, Parks didn't seem to know who Jerwood or Conflict were, but if you know, you know, and Conflict was known as the leaders of what Ian Glasper describes as the militant second wave of UK anarcho-punk scene. Parks recalled being approached by Brixton police just days before the gig. The police presented the promoter with a flyer depicting a sniper on the roof of what appears to be the academy, with a slogan encouraging the killing of police officers. The police claimed to have intelligence that the gathering was intended to assemble an anarchist army bent on taking down the police force. Parks wasn't convinced, and Jerwood denied any knowledge of intended police sniping, so the pair pressed on with the planning of the event. Jerwood presented his demands. No meat be served, vendors get free admission, and split the door 50-50 with the venue, the bands only being paid if there's a profit. Buses were arranged from various points throughout the UK, and most importantly, no cops. Police were not allowed entry without joint permission of the band and the venue. The conflict camp was informed, however, that the police would be in full force outside the academy. Keep in mind, the Brixton police were not known for being the kinder, gentler security force. Also keep in mind, everyone still thinks Jerwood works for rough trade. They can crush us, they can bruise us, they can even shoot us, but the show must go on. The day of the show, the experienced promoter noticed how oblivious Jerwood was in terms of putting on a concert of this scale. It was clear he lacked knowledge of regulations and insurance. They spent the pre-show hours helping set up booths for causes, as Parks describes ranging from nuclear disarmament to radical vegetarianism, as well as fighting with venue staff about setting up non-fireproof banners and uninsured television stacks. Somerset's Thatcher on Acid opened the show. Formed in 1983 by Ben Corrigan and Martin Hoskin with the intent of staging guerrilla performances, gate-crashing shows, seizing the stage, and playing until kicked out, they found this to be more difficult than it was worth, and they morphed into a legit band. Not used to playing for such a large audience, they lacked the skill of crowd control and were tasked with asking the fans to stop jumping on stage. 
Not surprisingly, the anti-authoritarian punks didn't take kindly to the request and showered the group with glass. But that was the price they paid to prevent the gig from being cancelled during the opening set as the stage manager had threatened. The bridge between Thatcher on Acid and Conflict was Rasta poet Benjamin Zephaniah, who, according to Corrigan, got the crowd so riled up, the, quote, tension in the place just before Conflict actually came on was so strong, it was almost physical. Indeed, future Conflict drummer Stuart Meadows, who was in the crowd that night, recalls, the atmosphere was fucking electric. As Zephaniah wrapped up, the venue went dark and silent. Suddenly, the stacked televisions lit up, showing footage of police brutality, along with news reports of violence and war. The intended Pavlovian response was achieved, and a 4,000-strong crowd of hardcore punks began to salivate. After about 15 minutes of this, the place became silent again, and attention once more became palpable. The silence was broken by Francisco Paco Carreno pounding on the drums, as the band, who once described themselves as not a miniature crass, opened with the cover of Crass's Band from the Roxy. Retooled as Band from the UK and featuring Steve Ignorant, formerly of Crass, it was the first of 15 Crass songs performed that night, comprising just about half of the total set. When Jorba took the stage with his signature Liberty Spikes, the rough trade ruse was dropped. Parks writes that he was, quote, a little pissed off at the deception, but also confused because he probably would have booked them without the Cloak and Dagger antics. Throughout the night, fans continued to jump on stage only to get dragged off by security. This became tiresome quickly, and the firm hired to maintain order was scolded by Jerwood mid-set. Watch the lower right corner of the screen as the fan is whisked off stage left. Absolutely nothing had gone smoothly that night, and now Jerwood began calling attention to perhaps the biggest problem. Let's go back to the beginning. One of the first conditions the venue reneged on was a barrier between the crowd and the stage. As soon as Conflict arrived to set up, they saw that and were disappointed, but chose not to start a fight over it. The vegetarian caterers were denied entry to the show, and as Ian Glasper points out, beef hamburgers were being served next to animal rights booths. The skirmishes started to break out among fans, between punks and security inside, and between punks and police outside. By all accounts, venue security was heavy-handed. Even the performers had run-ins with the firm. Remember Thatcher on Acid frontman Ben Corrigan? He writes of being denied entry backstage despite his all-access pass. He left the venue early as fights began breaking out among the crowd, and the bouncers, he says, had Rottweilers at the side of the stage. As conflict set near its planned conclusion, security was fairly lax, allowing a number of punks on stage. They weren't causing trouble, so they let them stay. By the way, conflict brought their own security, but the academy felt the need to supplement with their own. So as the number of punks on stage became uncomfortable for venue security, a gang of black t-shirts swarms from stage left and forms a human wall between Jerwood and his fans. About 90 seconds into whichever way you want it, Jerwood halts the concert. He scolds the overzealous goon squad while also imploring his audience to stay off the stage. The crowd responds antagonistically, calling the frontman Popstar. Quite the anarcho punk insult. Jerwin spends the next two minutes appealing to the crowd's anarchist sensibilities before the band resumes playing. The stage still lined with bouncers. About a minute later, the contingent of seated punks seen earlier on stage right have begun moshing on stage, and a fight breaks out among them. For the next 10 minutes, security, management, band, fans, and crew all mill about the stage arguing. The show is over. The band might be over. The scene might be over. Conflict exit the stage, and venue management ushers the crowd out every exit available. Tired, confused, angry, disappointed, and feeling rejected, the ungovernable force of 4,000 shuffled out the front door to meet the fully outfitted and anxious Brixton police force of about 1,500. A battle was imminent, and both sides seemed eager to jump in. No one knows for certain who threw the first punch, but the inevitable showdown quickly turned into an all-out street battle between punks and cops. As happy as Academy staff were to get rid of the punks, seeing the studded belt crowd get beaten by truncheon-wielding riot cops gave them no pleasure, and they quickly reopened the doors, offering the former cinema as a place of refuge. 
Tube stations and bus routes were closed, thus denying the punks a chance to escape Brixton. Conflict was kept in the green room until the action subsided around 1.45 the next morning, when police followed the band to the city limits. Ultimately, more than 50 punks were arrested and 9 cops were injured. The venue and nearby businesses sustained about £30,000 worth of damage. Unbeknownst to seemingly anyone, a number of police were inside the venue watching the entire event unfold. Their statements formed the foundation for questioning the band in an unsuccessful attempt to charge them with incitement. The concert was recorded with five cameras in a mobile sound studio. It was always Conflict's intent to release the event on video and on record, but with the way things went down, it became necessary to do so. According to the liner notes, the double LP was mixed at Southern Studios London on May 1st and 2nd, 1987, and mastered at Tape 1 London on June 3rd, 1987. Titled Turning Rebellion Into Money, the double album was released later in the year and profits were used to pay off debts, contribute to a defense fund for those arrested, and a little bit was thrown to the vendors. According to Maximum Rock and Roll, included in the album was a booklet explaining the event both ups and downs. As for the video, Ian Glasper writes the videotapes have been, quote, in contractual limbo ever since. Much of the Brixton gig is shown on the concert compilation VHS Force or Service, The Gathering of the 5000, which was released in 1995 by Conflict Mortar Hate Records and includes footage of shows from 84 to 87. The entirety of the gig is available unofficially online. Conflict's difficulty in booking London gigs was only amplified by the failure of this gig. In an interview for Crisis Point fanzine that year, the band says they didn't get a penny from the event and they were actually given a bill for a thousand pounds in damages. None of the vendors got anything beyond what they sold at the tables. In a 2022 interview, Jerwood said he was broken for a while after, but looking back at the biggest underground punk concert to date, it couldn't have ended any better. Their efforts to reclaim and reinvigorate the punk movement that night seemed to have failed. Jerwood concluded the show angrily echoing Crass's assertion that In that same Crisis Point interview, Jerwood was asked if the gig made any difference. He said he didn't know. What do you think? Is the punk movement dead? Was this show its death now? Leave a comment below. And join me next month when we look at a time when the punk scene was unified. We'll look at the benefit festival for Dead Boy's Johnny Blitz held at CBGB in 1978 and featured the biggest names in New York City punk along with John Belushi and Divine. Meanwhile, follow my half-assed attempt to chronicle the day-by-day -day events in the history of the scene with Today and Punk Rock History via tiprh.start.page. For this month in punk rock history, I'm Brendan McCabe. He's supposed to be trying to spin that fucking thing, but you're so strong.